Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's garage, we'll be taking a largely unexpected look at the battery in a 2016 Chevy Tahoe. We'll go through all the steps of finding a dead, boosting with the jumper pack, and ultimately replacing the original battery with a new glass mat replacement unit. Along the way, we'll take a look at a couple of different jump starting options as well. What you learn here today will apply fairly specifically to a set of vehicles that are essentially as mechanical twins, like the Suburban, and then more or less to other vehicles in equal measure to how similar they are to this truck. But one thing I will not cover today are hybrid vehicles like the Tahoe Hybrid. They're a special case, so if you see big, thick orange cables under your hood, call the dealership. Like Vegas, red and black are all we'll be talking about today. Today's adventure began right before the Thanksgiving holiday. My son was about to visit from college, and his Tahoe hadn't run in a few months. Unfortunately, it also didn't have a trickle charger or maintainer on it, and as a result, the battery had run stone cold dead as it sat there. First, as you will see, I attempt to boost it with a lithium ion battery pack with some smoky results. After fixing the battery pack, I managed to get the truck running and to confirm that the charging system was indeed putting out about 14.7 volts. It even restarted after some recharge time. Unfortunately, however, the battery would turn out to only have a reserve capacity of about a single start and would ultimately fail to start for him one morning upon his return. Since the charging system tested fine, I was reasonably confident that the battery itself was bad and would need to be replaced. This might surprise you on a 2016. It would seem like a fairly new truck to be needing a new battery, being only just outside the factory three-year warranty. The reason is because running batteries entirely dead is hard on them, and it is especially hard on the modern form of battery known as the AGM style. Rather than simply being filled with liquid acid and lead plates, the acid is held in absorbent glass mats. This is good for an off-road vehicle that might otherwise spill the battery contents, and I suppose that's why this particular Tahoe, which is the 4x4 variant, has this kind of battery. They look largely the same externally as the more conventional lead acid plate battery and the replacement procedure is identical. So all that really matters to us at this point is that it costs about twice as much. And so I'm sticking with what the manufacturers recommend, at least during the warranty window. My first response to the dead battery was to simply jumpstart the truck with a booster pack. So let's see how that went. All right, so it's completely dead. No dome light, no gauges, no nothing. Got my uh, little booster pack here. And I'm going to uh, film, try and do a live boost of this to see how well it works in real world conditions. Which is to say, I do not expect to need it right now. I'm going to plug this in first before I turn it on. It's pretty hard to see because it's a good kind of size connection. There you go. Turn it on. Positive connection here. And I think I'm going to go right to the battery because I don't see another good ground here. Turn it back off for a second. No, it should matter, but. Alright, it sounds like it's coming to life, which must mean it's live, and there's a green light on the IntelliBoost. So. Okay, got the key handy, charger is connected, so the green, we're on the fire. Smoke came out of the, uh, and it may still be smoking, I can't really tell. It seems very unhappy. It did start the vehicle. I turned it on. Not much. I plug this. She could just be overheated, I imagine. Still reads 100%, I assume it did take some power. So, I'm not buying the 100% case, but. We'll have to try this again and see if it works. At this point, I'm fairly certain of four things. The charging system is putting out good power. The connections to the battery are clean and tight, 
and a quick test with an ammeter confirmed that there does not seem to be any significant parasitic draw when the vehicle is parked. So it really seems that the battery is the primary suspect. Ironically, I first referred to a number of videos on changing a Tahoe battery, and that you skip the interesting part, how to actually remove and replace the battery itself. I believe that's because the correct and official procedure, depending on your options, likely involves draining the engine coolant so that you can remove the recovery tank, which then makes it possible to physically remove the battery. Not knowing any better, I took a shortcut, but it involves a quote-unquote secret, tipping the battery over on its side. We can get away with this, I believe, because the battery in this case is AGM and it is therefore tolerant to being tipped over. I'd be happy to hear from you and hear your thoughts on this approach in the comments section. Let's take a look at the steps to change the battery from start to finish. For your comfort, and because I'll be working alone, I'll leave the camera stationary with a clear, well-lit view of the work rather than on my smiling face. But don't worry, it'll be back right after this. So our first step is going to be removing this strut rod that runs between the cowl and the fender. It adds some structural rigidity to the truck, but it blocks our access to the battery. You'll notice there's a piece of fabric. Its purpose there is to stop you from shorting out between the positive pole of the battery and the metallic structure of the strut rod itself. The idea being that if you're loosening the positive post, or tightening I suppose, and you're using a metal tool and you touch the strut rod, you won't do any welding. So, we can take the strut rod out now. This is actually an open plastic split loom, so you could just pull it sideways, but I'm trying not to break it, so I'll work it out gently and set it aside. I've now loosened the battery hold down far enough that I can work it out and pull the whole brick out with my hand. I don't want to lose it later, so that's why I'm removing it now. Now, if you happen to be some combination of strong and fortunate, you'll be able to loosen this thing by hand. I, however, was not so lucky. Try as I might, I had to run off and get my impact, which is generally not a great idea when you're dealing with lead uh, battery terminals. I probably should have grabbed a socket, but hey. I'm making a video here and I'm a busy man, so I'm going to do everything with an impact, even though it's not always a great idea. With the negative cable disconnected, we can snag it back under this uh, Flavin cable here. And then we can open up the positive connector, the protective cover over it, and again, take a shot, loosen it by hand, and yes, this time I get lucky. 10 millimeter. Now we can pop off the plastic cover by pulling backwards on the inner clips. And the satisfying kapow with which it comes off will tell you, oops, I think I broke it. But actually, this inspection reveals, nope, it's fine. Next, I'm going to loosen, remove, and tuck out of the way the positive cable. There's no more electrical connection here because we've already long since removed the negative. So, we don't have to be super careful, but I might as well be diligent and not put it in a way that it's going to pop back and hit the battery. I secure it out of the way. Hook it onto something else, and I'd be in the fight with the battery. I've got a dollar that says this coolant recovery tank actually has to come out of the way if you read the shop manual. And if you're working at the dealership and you're getting paid by the hour, have at it. For me, I'm going to manhandle this thing out of here. And, and I'll notice later that this one may not be AGM, and so leaning it on its side may not have been the smartest ticket. But the new one is indeed AGM, so we're okay. The new battery fits reasonably well, although if it were about an inch, actually even a quarter inch smaller in every dimension, it would fit in a lot easier. So thanks GM, but we'll make it work. Pry back the tank a little bit and it seems to fall in. And maybe that's why they have a vibration resistant AGM battery in here. Next step is to physically secure the battery in by putting back in the retention block and tightening it down. Again, I'm going to use an impact, but you were tightening up against a plastic case of a battery, so discretion really says that you should get out a socket driver or a hand yeah, wrench and do it the old-fashioned way so that you don't break your new battery.
And again, don't go crazy tightening the hold down block. Now this thing only fits in here one way. Let's see if I can figure it out. Come on, big fella. There you go. Now if you're working in Saskatchewan or somewhere where it's 40 below and really cold, this thing will not flex like it is for me. It will just break. So please be careful if you're working in a colder environment. Having referred to the draftsman-like sketches I made, I know that the bar goes in from the bottom underneath the body panel and then the bolts drop in through. I'm spinning these in by hand and not tightening them very much because if you tighten any of them, you won't get them all in. So just spin them in first and then go back and tighten them at a second pass. Now we can go ahead and route the ground cable under the uh, uh, Flavin harness. Yeah. And we'll connect it up. And now the vehicle is live again. Now you do want these tight for good conductivity, but contrary to what you're seeing here, more is not better. Uh, as long as it's snug and the cable can't be rotated by hand, you should be good. So I'm content to do this one by hand. And it was already tight enough because I'd already done so. Give everything the once over and just have a have a good look because half the time you'll spot your mistake if you actually look. Let's go fire it up and see if she runs. Okay, once more this time with better luck hopefully. Got a dash. Shut the entertainment center. And it fires right up. Once the gauge settles, we see that it says 14 point, I don't know, four, five. Looks good to me. See, I'm still here. Isn't object permanence wonderful? Now that you've seen the steps required to change the battery on your own, you can make the judgment call of whether you want to undertake this job yourself. I paid 175 for the AGM battery at Costco, and they're close to that for the regular battery at the dealership and the labor rate was running several hours, depending on the vehicle, so ask in advance. What else is going on in Dave's garage this December? Well, with the Christmas season upon us, there are a lot of LED lighting projects going on, but there are four videos upcoming for those of you that ring the notification bell or subscribe or do whatever it is that matters on YouTube these days. And they are the conclusion of the 48 volt ATV upgrade, including the final assembly and test drive. It's terrifyingly fast and yet surprisingly reliable, kind of like our Tesla P100D. And speaking of cars, the second video will feature the latest addition to the Dave's Garage fleet, the Mercedes AMG S63 Coupe. We'll take a look at the car and how I ultimately arrived not only at the decision to purchase an S63 Coupe, not least of which because I just enjoy gratuitously saying Coupe, but how and why I bought this particular example out of Chicago rather than buying locally. Well, on the electronic side, we'll build this Funkadelic Sound Reactive Atomic Light, and we'll finally wrap up the sequential brake light project with a complete how-to video and Amazon-ready parts list, so you can add these to your own truck. Before I vanish into the ether, if any of these sound interesting, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel, because right now I don't have enough videos for YouTube to start organically recommending my content yet. Your kind support can change that. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Dave's Garage.